Hello, hello everybody, this is TipTopMTG here today with another Magic the Gathering video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about Zendikar Rising and the top 10 most expensive cards from it. So I'm going to go over all the cards, what they do, why I think they're so expensive, and then I'm going to talk about it compared to previous sets in terms of value, um, and we're also going to look at some other interesting cards. So why don't we actually just start by jumping right into this. So at the number 10 slot, um, we have... Ancient Green Warden. Now, you'll notice here this one says $9.99. Now, I want to go over a couple things before I get into this so that everyone hears it. First off, um, these are as of September 10th. So, if prices change in the future, if something becomes part of the meta or banned, or just as time goes on, these prices are very likely to go down. So, if you're looking and you're like, wait, this card I just pulled, it's not worth $10, well, it's probably going to go down. Now, generally things stay in the same order so ancient green ward will generally be the most the top 10 or the sorry the 10th most expensive card unless something changes in the meta like a card finds a home that no one saw before you know it actually was introduced or if a card is like realized to be super bad like if people realize that ancient green warden is a little too expensive for their deck this card will crash in price another thing this price is in usd so uh yeah uh just know that and these cards are as of card kingdom uh so so first off, these are pre-order prices, so that almost always means they're going to go down. Second, um, Card Kingdom has pricier prices compared to something like you could get on eBay. So, you know, you are looking at this, you probably won't be able to sell them for this much, but if you wanted to buy the card, uh, that's what's happening. And so this video is useful so that you know what cards to look out for when you're opening packs. So like I said, number 10 is Ancient Green Warden. So this is a six cost creature elemental 5-7 with reach, and it says you may play lands from your graveyard. So it's a very powerful effect, um, and I believe in Historic we will now have three different effects that do this. Uh, so that will be kind of interesting. Now, if a land entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, an uh, trigger it uh, triggers an additional time. So any landfall triggers will happen twice. Now this also applies to things like Field of the Dead, um, if that was still legal in many things. So, like, if, yes, if you're playing Field of the Dead, this doubles for your Field of the Dead. It doubles anything that's, like, whenever a land enters the battlefield, do something. So, it doesn't specifically have to be a landfall. Um, so, that's very interesting and I think has a lot of applications. Uh, I think this could be a top end for a lot of different decks. And since it's in green, six mana really isn't that much. I mean, it's almost like a four mana thing in any other color. So, yeah. Next we have Omnath Locus of Creation. So this one's at $10.99. So going up, it's going up a dollar. And this is a four cost legendary creature, elemental 4-4. And when it enters the battlefield, draw a card. So just nice blue effect. And then whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, it's if it's the first time it happens, you gain four life. If it's the second time, you add one mana of each color that Omnath is. So red, green, white, blue. And if it's the third time, you're gonna deal four damage to each opponent and each planeswalker you don't control. So yeah, um, you, it's a pretty good, you know, commander, and I think that's why it is so high up. I don't expect this to see much play in standard, although the fact that you can play, say, a Fabled Passage and then crack it, and that generates you four mana with Omnath is pretty insane, so I would not be surprised if this sees some uh, more, you know, maybe not top-end meta, but maybe on the lower tiers, you might see an Omnath or two in a Landfall deck, but I expect this to be a real powerhouse in things like Brawl and Commander, where you can really take advantage of its full potential being able to get it out every single game it's also interesting because it is a new four color legendary which there's only one of each four color combination excluding partners um and so the ability to have another four color one it opens up a lot of doors like if you didn't like what that four color combination did in the previous commander well then you had to use a partner pair so i think that this is really interesting next we have jace mirror mage so this one's going up a dollar again so we're at 11.99 and it's a three cost blue legendary planeswalker jace for loyalty uh, this was the first card revealed from the set it has kicker two and it says whenever it enters the battlefield if it was kicked create a token that's a copy of him except it's not legendary and it's starting loyalty is one so you'll get two jaces for uh five or one jace for three and you can plus one him to scry two or you can zero him to draw a card and reveal it remove a number of loyalty counters equal to that card's converted mana cost from jace uh so a lot of interesting things you can do here uh there is a you know some interesting things you can do with the draw trigger and replacing it to then get rid of the downside. So there are some really interesting things you can do. I think that this is a planeswalker that is kind of broad in a sense. Um, it 
you know, is useful in a lot of different decks. Decks would love to be able to just scry two for free every turn, you know, pay, play a permanent that lets you scry two every turn for three mana. That's pretty good. Now, obviously this can be attacked, which is why it's allowed to have that ability. But I, uh, I do think this is a very, like, what did I say, vague Planeswalker that can fit into a lot of different blue decks. It's very similar to what I would say Teferi is, the one from Corset 2021, where I would be fine jumping a blue Teferi, the mono blue Teferi, into, like, almost any deck. So... Yeah, I feel like Jace kind of fills that same role in a less impressive way. Next, we have Morag Fury of Akoam. So again, we're going up another dollar, so we're at 13, and it's a 6-cost red legendary creature, Minotaur Warrior 6-6, six, six, and it, it says each creature you control gets plus 1, plus 0 for each time it is attacked this turn, and then Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your under your control, if it's main, if it's your main phase, sorry, uh, you get an extra combat after this main phase, and then you untap everything. Um... So, I think that this card is going to crash in price, because I think people are going to, you know, they first read it and they're like, oh, extra main phase every time I can, or extra combat step every time I can, you know, play a land, I'm going to get something infinite going, I'm going to try something, you know, and I think a lot of people are going to realize that this is severely limited. I'm not saying it's a bad card, there are some very interesting things you can do with it, but there are some limitations, like the fact that the land has to enter during your main phase, meaning any combat-based triggers that would dump a land into play don't really work because they're going to happen during combat, and the biggest issue with this is that it does not create an extra main phase like most uh, combat steps do. Most extra combat say there's a combat step followed by an additional main phase but no this is just combat steps so if you can dump four land you're gonna get four combat steps in a row and no main phases and then you'll go to your actual combat step and then you'll go to your second main phase uh and so because it doesn't create main phases i think that it's a little bit uh less exciting than a lot of people think but i think there are some very interesting things you can do with it as well so let me know what you guys think about morag uh in the comments down below Next, we have Ayesha, Soul of the Wild. So this is the same price as Morag. It's a five cost green star star legendary creature elemental. And its power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. So it's probably going to be at least a 5-5. Five, five. And then when it enters the battlefield, creatures, not when it enters the battlefield, but while it's on the battlefield, non-token creatures you control are forest lands in addition to their other types. So uh, yeah, that's pretty awesome. It lets you tap any of your creatures for mana. It boosts Ayesha's power. Ayesha's power and toughness are equal to the number of lands and creatures you control, which is pretty insane for 5. Uh, it's going to ramp you a ton. It protects your stuff from non-land permanent targeting. And it's just, it is definitely an interesting card that I think has a lot of applications as a utility piece. Next, we have Scourge of the Skyclades. It's a two-cost black creature demon star star with kicker five, and when it enters, if you cast the spell with the kicker, each opponent, each player, sorry, loses half their life rounded up, and its power is equal to each player's life, uh, the highest life play, oh my gosh, Scourge of, I'm just going to read what it says instead of summarizing, Scourge of the Skyclave's power and toughness are each equal to 20 minus the highest life total among players. So if someone's at 10 life, if that's the highest player, this thing is a 10-10 for two. Uh, and this is very similar to a card called Death's Shadow in Modern, and I think that's why it's so uh, propped up. It has a lot of potential to be powerful. Next, we have Seagate Stormcaller. It's a two-cost blue creature human wizard, and when it enters the battlefield, copy the next instant or sorcery spell with CMT two or less you cast this turn when you cast it. If it was kicked, copy that thing twice. And when this came up, I said, you know what, this is probably one of the dud mythics of the set. I really didn't think this would be a $15 card. I was like, okay, yeah, you're copying something and you're getting a body out of it, but I would rather play Lutri, which I know adds in blue, but Lutri can copy anything. It, it's a lot more typical. This, your opponent sees it coming. It's not flash speed. So you can really only copy sorceries or and it's cmc2 or less it's not even like you're just copying the next thing like double cast is a card and it's in red obviously but i just i'm not a huge fan of this card but i see why people would be interested in it and it's going for 15 bucks next we have nissa of shadowed bows it's a four cost black and green legendary planeswalker nissa for loyalty and whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control put a loyalty counter on it then you can plus one and untap target land you control you may have it become a three three un elemental creature with haste and menace until end of turn it is still a land and then you can minus five it and put a creature card with cmc less than or equal to the number of lands you control onto the battlefield from your hand or graveyard with two plus plus one plus one counters on it so yeah i think this one is justifiably 15 bucks i think that 
it has a lot of potential, especially with Sultai control being such a big thing. I mean, the ability to just untap one land and maybe have it become a creature, you don't even need that, is pretty good. And then the ability to start resurrecting your Uros from the graveyard to, you know, get another effect or, you know, just having anything come back is really, really good. So I think that this is a fairly good Nissa. It's not nearly as broken as Nissa who shakes the world. And I think that it's probably an appropriately powered powerful mythic. Uh, I think that this is probably your planeswalker. This should probably be the highest power of a planeswalker. I know a lot of people think that her plus one should be a zero or a minus one, which I do see, but I think it is fine. I think her ultimate is like okay, and the fact that the lands only last until end of turn means she's not defending herself. So yeah, I think it's pretty, um, Oh, it's good, but not, you know, $30 good. Next, we have Leyline Tyrant. So we're at the number two spot, and it's only, the uh, you know, it's still only worth 15 bucks at pre-order prices, which is kind of low. It's a four-cost red creature dragon, a 4-4 four, four with flying, and it says you don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases end. When it dies, you may add any amount of red, and when you do, it deals that much damage to any target. So, uh, yeah, I talked a lot about this. I think over the course of three spoiler videos, I talked about this guy, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it here, but I am basically going to say I think this doesn't feel super red to me. I think it should say you don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases ends as long as an opponent has lost life since the beginning of your last turn or whatever, um, and that would be more interesting or the beginning of the, or the you know, sometime. Just pick some time, and they have to, you have to be constantly dealing damage to your opponent, otherwise you're going to accidentally lose all your red mana or something. Or maybe Leyline Tyrant says, um, if you don't, if it, you know, if you, if an opponent hasn't lost life since last combat or whatever, sacrifice it, and then you get the whole die trigger, you can spend all your red mana. So it's kind of like it's unstable, and that's a little bit more flavorful than just, here's a green effect in red. But either way, I digress. F 15 bucks. Then we have Lithoform Engine, which is a $20 card. It's a four-cost legendary artifact. You can pay two, tap, and copy target activated or triggered ability you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. Pay three, tap, copy target instant or sorcery you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. And pay four, tap, copy target permanent spell you control. And the copy becomes a token. So you can copy anything in the game. Uh, unfortunately, like, you can't copy, like, a permanent that's already on the battlefield. And it does have to be a permanent spell. Um, but yeah, this is really good. It's versatile. In a deck that cares about activated or triggered abilities, this is pretty good. In a deck that cares about instant and sorceries, this is pretty good. In a deck that cares about permanence, this is pretty good. So it's good in a lot of different decks. I don't know how good it'll be in standard where, you know, four mana and is a decent amount, and then you have to pay the mana on top of it to copy things, but I think in car in formats like Brawl and Commander, this will be a very powerful and popular card that I could see going into a lot of different decks. Now, those are the top 10, but that's not it for this video. I want to talk about the top 10 compared to Corset 2021's top 10. So, looking at it, if we start from the top, which is the lowest priced cards, um, the lowest priced card in Zendikar Rising is worth a dollar more than the lowest cost card in Corset 2021. But that doesn't particularly matter unless there's a bunch of cards that are $9.99 and, uh, you know, that's it. But... If we look at the top end, the most expensive card from Corset 2021 was Teferi Master of Time, which was a $30 card. That's 10 more than our current highest. And you might be like, okay, it's a fluke, one really powerful card. But no, then we get $27.99, $25.99, and then we get down to the $15.99s, or the $14.99s, I should say, versus we only have one card, you know, if you look at the top end, Zendikar Rising is much on the uh, much lower, but Zendikar Rising does have the Expeditions, which is something that maybe offsets it a little. I think that Corset 2021 was a little bit more valuable to open, which is kind of weird saying it was a Corset. Now, I believe Grim Tutor crashed in price, um, but Ugin is still doing strong, being super powerful in um, Commander, not Commander, in Standard right now. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see how these prices hold up in comparison to older sets. And then we have something I want to talk about, which is just the pathways. Um, I was really interested in these because I've seen a lot of different opinions on this. And when we get into the set review, which will be coming out the, I believe, the day that the set launches in paper, I will be doing a set review. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot about power level because that's what I want to talk about. But uh, I think pathways are underrated. I think that there are a lot of people saying, yeah, they're kind of bad. No one's really going to play them. But in my opinion especially in things like standard, they're pretty good. I mean, if you're running, say, a planes, and you're say you're playing an Izzet deck, and you 
are running, say, I don't know, seven islands, six uh, mountains or whatever, I would lose two mountains, two islands, and just put in the pathway because they're, unless you have something that cares about it, unless you're tutoring for basics or you care about land types, they are better than basics. So yes, maybe the green ones aren't as good because the green ones, you may want them to be basic so you can go search them out with Cultivate. But outside of that, they are better than basics in every way. So I think that these could uh, shift up. Maybe the ones that aren't in green could shift up a little bit. But right now, they're all going for seven or six ninety nine. Um, yes, I don't think they're as good as shock lands, but I, I think they're better than people are making them out to be. And I actually think that's true of all modal double faced cards. I think that yes, it's a bad land. Yes, it's a bad spell. But when you combine them to get when you combine them together, they are pretty good. So we will have to wait and see. Alright guys, that's going to do it for this video. If you found it useful, please hit that like button, subscribe for more awesome content like this, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.